there's probably no other nation on earth that celebrates Halloween in the way America does. And that even includes uh, those nations that are the birthplace of it, specifically the, the British Isles, which I'll say a little word about in just a little bit. But <clears throat> Halloween, in one sense, was not always the sensation in American life that it is today. Uh, the tradition of jack-o'-lanterns was brought over by Irish immigrants, started to spread in some popularity in this country in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, the tradition of trick-or-treating, which is also more or less rooted in Irish culture, just really began to get popular here in the United States on the eve of the Second World War. Um, my parents knew the trajectory when I was on when I would take friends around on just ordinary days of the year, like August 15th, then we would go trick-or-treating. <laughs> I simply couldn't wait. <clears throat> but Halloween, while it's obviously popular in other nations and, and, and exists also, of course, uh, within the Catholic and Anglican churches uh, as uh, All Hallows Eve or All Saints Day, uh, which precedes All Souls Day and is, is a holiday venerating those who have passed, which went to Halloween's ancient roots as a Celtic holiday, which did much the same thing. It was very simply a, a, a holiday to signal the transition from the fall season, the completion of the fall ha harvest, the bringing in of livestock and cattle and other animals into uh, out of the fields and into areas where they might be corralled or barned for the winter. Fires were lit in homes and hillsides, not only to signify the passing of the planting and harvest season and the onset of winter, but to welcome the ancient deceased ancestors to warm themselves by the fire. I don't go for any kind of divisions in how people celebrate holidays. The ancient Celts and you know, people say, well, you know, the church took these holidays and they changed the dates and they incorporated new meanings into them. And sure, that's true, but humanity has been borrowing and clipping and pasting from one another's religions literally since the dawn of time. Uh, the Hebrews borrowed from the Canaanites. Christianity was built in part on Hebraic culture. The Romans borrowed from everybody. Everything that characterizes religious history in our world is a process of experiencing, digesting, and reorganizing holidays with some different meanings, some different dates, some different geographical details. But Halloween, both when it was practiced by the ancient Celts, when it was incorporated in late antiquity into the church, and increasingly here in America, is a holiday that remembers the ancestors. I don't believe in drawing big lines of division between what ancient people were doing, what the early church was doing, and what modern people are doing. And speaking of what modern people are doing, Halloween in the United States today is becoming more than just kid stuff. Of course, there's parties, there's trick-or-treating, there's all the things that we associate with Halloween. The Halloween decorations go on sale progressively earlier and earlier each year at Dwayne Reed to the point where, you know, it's like you're... <laughs> You're shopping for coolers to go on picnics, and you know suddenly there are pumpkins and witches. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm not in a rush to ascribe a big spiritual significance to Halloween's popularity in the United States, because in the United States we like to have a good time, and if you give us a holiday, we'll immediately start licensing, and the Sci-Fi Channel will start showing Halloween specials progressively earlier, and it's the great pumpkin Charlie Brown will start coming on in July. That's how we do things. <laughs> So I'm not in a rush to ascribe spiritual significance to Halloween's popularity in, in the United States, but nonetheless, Halloween as an ancient ancestor-worshipping tradition is starting to find its footing here in America as a religious holiday. And the first place that you can look for evidence of that is not in Oakland, California, or Salem, Massachusetts, one of my favorite towns in America, or San Francisco, it's in the United States military. Halloween is recognized as a holiday within the United States military. Yes, it is. 
there are thousands and thousands and thousands of men and women service members who identify themselves as pagans, Wiccans, Druids, Druids, Neo-pagans. Since 1978, the U.S. Army Chaplain's Handbook has identified Halloween as a holiday that warrants observance and respect within the U.S. military. <clears throat> About two years ago, a serviceman wrote to me and he said, I'm in the military, nobody gives me off on Halloween. You know? And I said, well, I'm sorry, I don't make that policy, but <clears throat> along with many, many, many other holidays that don't give you uh, time off necessarily within the military, Halloween is specifically recognized and called out and has been for decades in the U.S. Army Chaplain's Handbook and it is identified very accurately as a holiday with ancient Celtic roots based in ancestor worship and the handbook goes on to explicitly state that there are service members who identify themselves as Wiccans, witches, druids, neo-pagans who have absolutely nothing to do with Satan worship or demonology or anything of the sort. The handbook goes on to say these are nature-based religions, very often members organized into covens. They are interested in reviving ancient spell work, ancient rituals associated with marking the passage of seasons, agricultural festivals, and various exercises and services and ceremonies and rituals that are the individual's attempt at some form of self-realization combining ancient practices with new. This is not the student handbook at Brown University. This is the U.S. Army's chaplain's handbook. And there's reason for cheer in that. There's reason for cheer in that. As far as I'm concerned. Because I believe, <clears throat> and a point that I return to in Occult America and other work that I produced, that the deepest meaning of our nation, I believe, is the protection of the individual search for meaning. As long as that is being preserved, whatever else is going wrong, that's at the heart of things. So long as that's going right, I believe we can solve and crack open the other things that are going wrong. Now, I don't want to paint an excessively rosy picture for you. There are lots of people in the military, and I hear from them from time to time, who are subjected to tremendous peer pressure, where, let's say, there will be a certain kind of religious prayers at what's ostensibly supposed to be a public ceremony or some sort of an induction ceremony, and people who identify themselves as belonging to what are still considered outsider religions or alternative faiths can experience soft harassment or sometimes hardened peer pressure. So I don't mean to paint an excessively rosy picture. But I have to say, for people who care about religious freedom above all other values, and I don't necessarily mean to say that the search for meaning could only be religious, but let's say, for those who care about the individual search for meaning above all other values, I want to return to these interesting signs that we're seeing in the military. Um, about seven years ago, the U.S. Air Force decided to run its own in-house survey to determine the religious affiliation of its various service people so that it could decide on the size of different chaplaincy programs. So the Air, Air Force runs its own in-house survey. It was voluntary. <clears throat> you didn't have to check a box identifying your religion. If your religion didn't appear, you could write in what it was or you could just leave it blank. In 2005, in this survey, 1,800 members of the Air Force alone identified themselves as Wiccan, as members of an ancient nature-based retention 
that was based in rituals marking the changing of the holidays that found its roots, to some extent, in ancient Celtic practice and some contemporary psychological and New Age-based practices. 1,800 people within the Air Force alone voluntarily elected to identify themselves as Wiccan on this survey. Now, there probably were other people who didn't want to identify themselves as being part of an outsider or a pagan faith for fear that it might result in some peer pressure or harassment. So you have to figure that unless the Air Force holds some special attraction for Wiccans, this trend is general throughout the military. It can't be that the Air Force is exceptional by itself. So come 2007, two years later, there is a consortium of families who lost loved ones to combat in Afghanistan. There were about 12 such losses. And their loved ones identified their religion as, again, Wiccan, Neo-Pagan, Druidic, and they wanted the right, as other service members have, to use their core religious symbol on their tombstones. And this consortium of families wanted the Veterans Administration to provide a pentagram, pentacle, on the tombstones of these fallen service members. And, <coughs> excuse me, the VA said, no. No, we don't recognize witchcraft as a religion. Um, George W. Bush, back in 1999, was on record saying he didn't recognize witchcraft as a religion, and he was disturbed to realize that uh, some sectors of the military were recognizing Halloween as a holiday, were providing official chaplains for Wiccans. Uh, the Georgia Congressman Robert Barr at the time sent a letter to an Air Force official complaining much the same way. He said, you know, we're going to have hearings about this. We're going to have legislation about this. We don't recognize witchcraft as a religion. But these 12 families said that was the faith of these service members who died in combat. If you can have a Star of David, if you can have a crucifix, if you can have a variety of other symbols, at the time there was 38 in all on the VA website, you can have a pentagram. The VA resisted. There were two organizations, the American Civil Liberties Union and another group, uh, which I love, called uh, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, uh, which is really a, a, a group that, that, that defends a, a radical civil libertarian approach to the individual's definition of his or her religious faith. They uh, sued the VA, and the VA backed down, and they, before the case went to court, because they would have lost. It could have traveled through the federal system. It could have gone up to the Supreme Court. Precedent is always on the side of religious liberty in this country. For all our problems, for all our problems, there's never been a time where that wasn't true. If the bar needs to get moved, the bar gets moved, always. I think that's cause for cheer. So, these 12 families institute uh, a lawsuit against the VA, the VA resists, but then the VA backs down. And if you go, you do it when you get home. You can probably do it right here on your handheld device, though I'd appreciate it if you waited until 7.10 or so. Um, go to the VA website. At this point, you will see over 40 symbols that can be placed on the tombstones of U.S. service members. You will see a pentagram right on the VA website. You'll see a whole range of, of symbols, including a symbol that belongs to a religious movement called Science of Mind, which is a positive thinking based religious movement. It has nothing to do with Scientology. I don't want there to be confusion there. I have a new book coming out in January about the history of positive thinking, and I talk about that movement in that book. Um, but if you go on the website of the VA and you look up symbols that can appear on a soldier's tombstone, at this point you'll see about 43, 44 symbols. And you will be astounded at the range of faiths that are recognized there, including uh, Wiccan neo-paganism as represented by the pentagram. So, <clears throat> now, I don't know that service members are going to get Halloween as a paid holiday off any time in this particular generation, but the fact is the U.S. military has to codify things. They have to think in terms of numbers. If you've got 20 such people on a base, well, 
then you need a chaplain for those people. And there are military bases all over this country. Obviously not in vast number, but you will find military bases all over this country that have Wiccan chaplains that permit covens, not some sanitized word, you know, that's supposed to make everybody feel okay, but that permit witches' covens to meet and hold ceremonies on bases, just like any other religious group. Again, the military has to do things by, by numbers and by organization, and when there's a civil liberties issue, I'm not saying that that erases the problem of peer pressure. I'm not saying that erases the problem of peer harassment. But because the military has to do things numerically and because its behavior towards service members is closely governed by certain legal precedents, you can look to the military as a weather vane of sorts for where the rest of the society is going. So, I do believe that certainly within a generation, maybe within our own generation, you are going to start to hear more and more of Halloween, not just as a holiday of trick-or-treating and decorations at Dwayne Reed, but as a really authentic religious holiday and as a retention of the ancestor worship practices that began among the ancient Celts and were later codified by the church into All Hallows Eve or All Saints Day and All Souls Day. These are all one holiday in a sense. And I don't think that drawing sharp lines of divisions helps us get any closer to religious truth because as I mentioned before, we have been borrowing and repurposing religions for a long, long time. And in many ways, America has been the great household of this borrowing and repurposing of religious ideas. And I think that that should be celebrated. America has played an extraordinary role in the 20th century in exporting religious ideas that had their roots in the ancient world that were repurposed by modern people out across the rest of the world. <clears throat> I use the term occult not to be provocative, um, certainly not to imply anything sinister. I do think the word has a certain romance to it, and I like it. But I use it because it has real historical integrity. And I want to say a word about where it comes from. Because occasionally there are misunderstandings about this, and they're not necessary. If we just sit down and look at the family tree of where some of these ideas come from in a very plain way, again, we find that there are greater connections among the religions than there are divisions. And I don't say that in some sort of namby-pamby way. I really mean that from the heart, and it's historically true. Obviously, rituals are different, aims are different, attitudes are different, but there's an extraordinary overlap in the genealogy of religions. And I don't see any reason why a person who's committed to ideas that could be called New Age or occult could not have a very rich relationship and discussion, and I mean this, with a person whose background is in Catholicism or the Anglican Church, or for that matter, any of the other world faiths, Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, they might have different vehicles, but the parts that construct those vehicles are interrelated, and there's absolutely no reason why there can't be a real discussion. So, the term occult, why do I use it? Why, most of the time people actually like it. <laughs> I very rarely run into trouble with it. I've given talks, gosh, from public libraries in Waltham, Massachusetts, up to Oakland, California, and um, uh, nobody ever seems to sweat the word. Um, I've given talks at universities and spiritual centers and uh, art spaces, public libraries, community centers, um, and usually I find a, a great receptivity to it. But once in a while, it does it does rub people in the wrong way, and I want to explain very simply where it comes from. <clears throat> the year 1460 was a very seminal year in the development of American religion. Uh, it was early in the Renaissance as it was taking shape in Florence, Italy. 
there was an extraordinary hunger to rediscover religious ideas from the ancient world. Renaissance scholars were fixated on this idea, I think rightly, that before the advent of Judaism, before the advent of Christianity, there had been in the Western world and in some other parts of the Near East, Far East, a kind of primeval theology, something that came earlier than everything else, and they were impassioned about discovering and locating this pristine primal theology. So in 1460, a Byzantine monk comes walking into the royal court of Cosimo de' Medici, the Florentine leader. And he has with him these Greek manuscripts that are purported to have been written by a figure named Hermes Trismegistus. Hermes Trismegistus was a Greek name for ancient Egypt's god of writing and god of intellect, Thoth. When the Greeks discovered Thoth in late antiquity, they felt he was so extraordinary a figure that he not only reminded them of their own god of writing and intellect, Hermes, or what the Romans called Mercury, and which today graces the front of Grand Central Station, just blocks away from here. But they felt that Thoth, the Egyptian god, was so extraordinary that he was three times as great as their own Hermes. So they would write inscriptions that read, Thoth is great, great, great. Or they would call him thrice greatest Hermes, hence the Greek appellation Hermes Trismegistus. So this monk wanders into the royal court at Florence and has these manuscripts in Greek that are attributed to this mythical ancient god-man whom the Greeks identified as a personification of the Egyptian god Thoth. And these manuscripts, which later come to be called the Hermetica or the Corpus Hermetica, are collections of ancient rituals, spells, magical processes. In particular, these manuscripts are concerned with how individual people, through proper degree of prayer and meditation and adoration of the gods and mental preparation can turn themselves into vessels for divine energies. So these manuscripts are dedicated to exploring how the individual man or woman, the individual worshiper, can render himself into a kind of lightning rod for energies from the divine and perhaps gain the power of prophecy or clairvoyance <coughs> or various forms of special foresight or languages. And the Florentine leader, Cosimo de' Medici, and his court scholars are so entranced with this material, they think, could this be what we've been looking for? Could this be that primeval theology that we've been searching for? So Cosimo has his court stop scholars stop translating Plato and start translating these magical hermetic manuscripts. Who wrote these? Frequently the name Hermes Trismegistus was applied to these manuscripts. Now that's the name of a deity. That's like putting the name Shiva or Kali or Krishna onto a manuscript. Who wrote these things? Well, the great likelihood is they were obviously written by people who were steeped in these practices, but who felt that they would be able to lend gravity, lend weight to these writings by putting a great figure's name on them. People would do this all the time in antiquity. 
There are manuscripts that are attributed to Moses. There are manuscripts that are attributed to Homer. Sometimes these things were written, <clears throat> in the case of Homer, for example, hundreds of years after his death. But it was a practice that if you put the name of a figure of great gravity onto something, you add clout to it. So that's what happened. So anyway, Renaissance scholars are absolutely fascinated with this material. They say, well, here at last, finally, we found something that predates Judaism, that predates Christianity. They had certain ancient manuscripts in their possession. Mostly, they were from the Judeo-Christian tradition. They didn't know much about other traditions at that point within Renaissance courts. There were many, many Christian scholars within Renaissance courts who were fascinated with Jewish Kabbalah. And they created a, a kind of Christian Kabbalah, which continues to color some occult and New Age-oriented works in Kabbalah today. This is sometimes to the frustration of traditional Kabbalists. But again, I would say, you keep peeling back the onion, and you'll find practices from all kinds of different religions steeped within the classical traditions. The language of Judaism didn't just come from the sky. The language of Judaism came from the hearts and intellects of deeply committed people in the Mediterranean basin who were coming in contact with all kinds of religious traditions and who shared with them calendars and harvest festivals and lunar timekeeping and all kinds of things. Be patient, be patient, I try to counsel people. When you see someone who talks about Kabbalah, for example, and it's not classical Kabbalah, well, you know, it has its roots somewhere. Sometimes it's very recent. Sometimes it comes from the late 19th century through various occult revivals. Sometimes it comes from permutations from the Renaissance, from a Christian Kabbalah. Be patient, because some of the organs and parts of what we're doing do have a shared genealogy, even if they have very different results. So anyway, the Renaissance scholars are hungry to find pre-Christian and pre-Jewish material. They feel they've found it in the Hermetica. They found practices from the ancient Egyptian world that they feel are an absolute core sample of what ancient people were thinking about. They're very excited. And they're trying to figure out <clears throat> what to call this stuff. They don't have a name for it. They think in Hebrew. They think in Latin. They think in Greek. They understand something about Greek antiquity. They understand Roman antiquity. They understand something about Jewish antiquity. But this stuff, they don't quite have a name for. Spells, alchemy, clairvoyance, the belief that not only the individual, but even objects, objects, <coughs> can be prepared in a special way to take on the energies of the gods. What do they call this? So there's a scholar named Cornelius Agrippa who writes in Latin. And by about the year 1530, he publishes a three-volume work on these Hermetic manuscripts and other manuscripts as well. There were Latin and Arabic manuscripts that had been preserved in the Arab world that also were a vessel for some of the ancient ideas. And he calls... Um, his three-volume work, Occulta Philosophia, The Secret Philosophy. Occulta, or occultum for plural. He uses the word occult to describe this ancient tradition for which we don't yet have a word. He is attempting the coinage of a phrase. What was this primeval philosophy? What was this ancient Egyptian philosophy? He calls it Occulta. And about 30 years later, the term occult starts to show up in the English language. That's where the term is from, period. It was an attempt on the part of Renaissance intellects to talk about this pre-Christian, pre-Jewish philosophy that they had found, that they associated largely and rightly with ancient Egypt, and they were trying to fit it into their world view. So Agrippa, 
calls it occulta, secret, hidden, unseen. And hence, that word starts to enter the English language and other Western languages. That's where it comes from, and that's where I use it, because it honors that historical family tree. Now, there's another twist in the story. There's a reason why not everybody is reading Agrippa's Occulta Philosophia today. There's a reason why uh, the Hermetica hasn't been flying off the shelves here at the library over the past year or two. <laughs> um, <laughs> The Renaissance scholars were so filled with ideals, they had felt that they had finally located and gotten a foothold into this primeval philosophy. But there was a scholar um, in 1640, Isaac Casaubon, who did some very important historical forensic work, and he found out that these initial Greek manuscripts, now by the way, they were written in Greek, and I'll get to this in a little more detail, I mean, the, the Egyptian culture, of course, had a, a written language in the form of hieroglyphs. Um, but these manuscripts were written in, in Greek. They, they came out of a, a kind of mosaic of cultures, and I'll get to that in just a moment. He discovered that these Greek magical manuscripts had certain references and identifying points in them that made it perfectly clear that these were not from deepest antiquity. There were many Renaissance scholars who thought of the mythical figure of Hermes Trismegistus as a contemporary of Moses. And they felt this stuff went way back. But Cosimon found that certain dates and certain historical telltale signs did not add up, and that in fact, these supposed primeval manuscripts were not from deepest antiquity. They had been produced probably in the city of Alexandria in the decades immediately following the death of Christ. So this became, at the time, this enormous historical letdown. It was as if, I don't know, <clears throat> we had discovered that Darwin just made everything up. You know. He was drunk, and uh, his publisher was calling, and he had to get it finished. You know, so <laughs> that discovery amounted to a tremendous letdown, and it diverted attention away from the Hermetica. There was also, and I don't have time to get into this. Buses have to be made back to Queens and such, but <laughs> another time. There was also a, a, a backlash that had built against the occult studies that had animated royal courts and some seminaries and some monasteries for generations at that point. And this backlash had started to boil over in Central Europe. And there was, as an indirect result, there was warfare between Catholic and Protestant armies, which had wound up dragging on for a generation in what was known as the Thirty Years' War. Religious tectonic shifts were going on. There were struggles between Protestant and Catholic powers. There were backlashes on all sides against some of the occult studies and traditions. And so the occult tradition in Europe as something that occupied the best and the greatest minds began to peter out. Now, <clears throat> today, there are actually very few good translations of the Hermetica. Sometimes I talk about this and people say to themselves, that's great. <clears throat> I want to get my hands on that stuff. <clears throat> Where can I find it? It's not very widespread, and that's partly a direct ripple effect of the mistake that was exposed in how this material was dated. But I also view this exposure of the Hermetica as having been dated wrong as an enormous <coughs> historical misunderstanding from which we as a culture have never really recovered. And it's one of the reasons why in the simplest sense there aren't very many good translations of the Hermetica. And it's also one of the reasons why it is so difficult in our society today, not as much as it used to be, but still difficult for us to talk about the shared genealogy and family tree 
of our different traditions, even when they diverge. <clears throat> the fact is, the Renaissance thinkers were not wrong to have placed their hopes and ideals in the Hermetica representing something truly ancient, something truly primeval. They were not wrong. They had the dates wrong. But the fact is, what the Hermetica represented was a vast oral tradition. This material was produced by Greek Egyptians in Alexandria in the decades immediately following Christ. That's correct. But the fact that the dates were wrong obfuscates the presence of oral tradition in the ancient world. Oral tradition, to a very great extent, is how things were passed down. The Egyptians were incredibly refined in all kinds of ways, but written language was not their chief mode of expression. There was a, that was more the style and the modality of the Greek culture, which is why these manuscripts were expressed, and more easily so, in a formalized Greek language than in hieroglyphs. Hieroglyphs were widely used, and there were Egyptian papyri that were quite detailed, but written expression was not the chief mode for the communication of ritual, myth, history, story in Egypt. It was more the exception. When Greco-Egyptians wrote down this material, they were not pulling it from out of the sky. They were relying upon an oral tradition that had been, <coughs> excuse me, that had been revived <coughs> in the time of Cleopatra and in the immediate wake of her reign. It was the last flowering of classical Egyptian culture. It wasn't long after that, that Egypt became formalized as a Roman military protectorate, and the temple orders began to fray and fall apart. This was a last effort <clears throat> on the part of Egypt's religious establishment to lay down with great clarity, and ancient Greek could render ideas tremendously clearly, probably more so than hieroglyphs, and more so than Latin in later generations, the Greek language was very finely honed, and this was an attempt to take oral tradition and set it down for the ages. So, <clears throat> a failure to take into account that when the stuff was produced doesn't tell you where it was from, what oral lineage it was part of, tended to contribute to a devaluation of the Hermetic manuscripts. They were also devalued because there Nobody could ever come up with a crystal clear definition of what was and wasn't a Hermetic manuscript. Some were in Greek, a few were in Latin, some were in Arabic, some were signed by Hermes Trismegistus, some weren't. You can't really quite come up with a cookie cutter description of what the Hermetic material was, but it was a vessel of oral tradition from ancient Egypt. And we were, we kind of permitted ourselves in the West to lose for a time, that precious, precious thread, however broken up and bastardized it may have been, and that happens, but we lose, we, we lost hold of that great precious thread for a long time because we got lost in the thicket of this controversy about the dates. That's why people haven't heard of it. That's why it's still unknown to vast numbers of people today, and it's hard to find good translations. There are a few out there, not a great many, not a great many. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned that there was a backlash against the religious experimentation that had been going on in the Renaissance. There was a backlash against Hermetic ideas, against occult ideas. There were tensions brewing between Catholic and Protestant powers. Europe was facing a showdown in terms of what its religious destiny would be, particularly in Central Europe. It was a German-speaking region of Central Europe that was bordered by the Rhine Valley on the west and Bohemia in the east. 
that during the Renaissance was just an incredible laboratory of religious experiment. That was where the Thirty Years' War broke out in 1618. And it was absolutely devastating. It reaped a path of famine and suffering and misery throughout that German-speaking portion of Central Europe. And that was where some of the most fervent religious experimentation was going on. That's where you had Christians studying Kabbalah. That's where you had people studying and translating the Hermetic manuscripts. That's where you had people experimenting with all kinds of ideas from scripture, including number symbolism and prophecy and attempts to arrive at different portentous dates. And <clears throat> you had Christian sects in Central Europe that were experimenting with the magical uses of music tone, voice, hymns. You had people experiencing all kinds of visions, prophecies. You had seers, often within the Protestant or Catholic churches. There was so much going on, and it was just destroyed in the wake of the Thirty Years' War. But right around this time, the American colonies were just getting built up. And within a generation of the end of the Thirty Years' War, which was in um, 1648, the American colonies, very, very early on, before there was a constitution, began to develop a reputation as a safe harbor for people with radical religious beliefs. To some degree, we owe that to a Quaker, a man named William Penn, who came from a wealthy family in Britain, a wealthy landowning family, but he had experienced discrimination as a Quaker at Oxford, and he decided to strike out for the American colonies, partly for commercial reasons, but he did ask the British Crown to give him not only a special land grant over the vast territory of Pennsylvania, <clears throat> but his unique project in Pennsylvania was to found a city that he thought could be a safe harbor for people of all different religious backgrounds, a city of brotherly love, which he called Philadelphia, which he founded in the early 1680s. Philadelphia was not a paradise. You couldn't run for office, for example, unless uh, you swore fealty to Christianity, but at the same time, it was home and it was made welcome to people of all different religious backgrounds, Jews, later Catholics, and all the people who were practicing some of the various hermetic arts in this German-speaking swath of Central Europe were considered welcome in Philadelphia. That's why a portion of Philly today is known as Germantown. And in 1694, there was a mystical group of monks who had been living to the east of the Rhine Valley. Their intellectual leader was a young man who was 21 years old named Johann Kelpius. They were a radical, mystical offshoot of the Lutheran Church very steeped in occult and hermetic practices, interested in prophecy, number symbolism, Kabbalah, different spells and formulas, astrology. And they were living in an area that had been destroyed by the Thirty Years' War. And Kelpius, heroically, who, based on what few records we have, was a very, very small, very thin guy. He seems to have had a left eye that was permanently closed. He was not what you would think of as a physically robust person. But he and his group of about 40 or so monks made this arduous journey out of Central Europe to England, from which they sailed across the Atlantic through many starts and stops. They had storms, they had to come back. But eventually, this small group of monks found their way first to Delaware, then to Philadelphia. Their aim was to go to Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love that they had heard about back in Central Europe. It's extraordinary how news of these things would travel. 
and they founded a colony on the banks of the Wissahickon Creek in Philadelphia in 1694. Um, <laughs> there's a structure that's still there that supposedly belonged to Kelpius, but it's controversial. I think it's a root cellar and not the place where he actually lived, but, you know, it's good enough for, like, heavy metal kids who go there and draw pentagrams and drink beer and stuff. <laughs> They're drawn to the place. Anyway, Kelpius and his group of mystical monks founded this commune on the banks of the Wissahickon Creek in 1694. They built a 40-foot square log cabin cathedral, and on top of it they mounted a telescope that they had brought with them from Europe that they decided to use to make their astrological notations in the heavens. They were steeped in all kinds of Kabbalistic and mystical practices, and Kelpius, through horrendous winters and through very, very tough and hard scrabble life on the banks of the Wissahickon, not a place where it's easy to grow things, not a place where it's easy to live. Beautiful terrain, but very knotty and rocky, freezing in the winter. They made it. They made it. You can only imagine how many such stories are lost because of ships that were destroyed, because of people that were killed in outbreaks of typhus, because of people who might have been killed in confrontations with the Native Americans, although the Philadelphians actually had a reputation for getting along well with the neighboring Native American tribes. They made it. And for several years, they maintained this colony on the banks of the Wissahickon. It started to attract other people who were engaged in similar mystical practices and were fleeing the backlash that had settled over Central Europe. In 1720, there was a follower of Johann Kelpius's named Johann Conrad Beisel, who came to America in search of Kelpius. He arrives in 720, 1720, only to learn the news that Kelpius had died years earlier in 1708, probably of uh, typhus fever. He had lived in an exposure to the elements for several years. But Beisel, within a space of a little over 10 years, founds a new and larger colony in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, in the south central portion of the state, south of Philly, called Ephrata. Ephrata, its buildings are still there. Ephrata, to some extent, is modeled on the community that Kelpius built, this Central European occult Christian community on the banks of the Wissahickon, and Ephrata lasted. Ephrata became a large place that people visited and wrote about and heard about. It was in newspapers. People wrote pamphlets about it. The residents there, again, they were steeped in a kind of Renaissance occult Christianity, absolutely committed to scripture, but also committed to ideas like astrology, the magical uses of hymn and tone, number symbolism, elements of Kabbalah. This worked. This worked. And it became a magnet for all kinds of people who were fleeing religious persecution in Europe. Another such group was a group called the Shaking Quakers, or what we call the Shakers. They resided in Manchester, England, throughout much of the 1700s and began to experience persecution and accusations of witchcraft starting around 1770. They were Quakers, they were Christians, but they would engage in all these wild practices where they would stay up all night praying and people would speak in tongues and go into spirit trances and they would conduct seances. And because of their gesticulations, they became known as the Shaking Quakers. Their titular leader was a young woman named Anne Lee, who was harassed and imprisoned on charges of witchcraft and sorcery. And she and her brother and a small handful of these Shaking Quakers decided that they too were going to cross the Atlantic. They were going to escape. They were going to get out of there and go to the New World the American colonies in 1775, which by that time had developed a reputation for religious liberty. So Anne Lee and her followers come here to New York City 
She works, along with her followers, a year of hard labor cleaning chamber pots and houses in New York for about one year. In fall of 1776, she and about 12 followers travel up the Hudson, and they start a colony in a town called Niskayuna, outside of Albany, still there. Her grave is still there. And they are successful. It is a terribly tough life. If you ever are up there and you look at the landscape, again, it's rocky, it's knotty. They didn't have money, so they had to buy these lousy pieces of land that would freeze over in the winter and get infested with mosquitoes in the summer. And <clears throat> in an early winter thaw in 1780, there were some guys from a nearby town of New Lebanon, New York. And my family and I have a house not too far from there. And uh, they broke through the winter ice. It was an early thaw. And they find Mother Ann Lee and this colony of about 12 shakers existing in the woods. And they're shocked and they say, who are you? And Mother Ann, who can be very enigmatic, said, we are the people who turn the world upside down. And he's been enchanted. Now when kids go to visit the remaining Shaker villages as museums today, it can be very boring. You know, they're, they're bust in and told, well, here's a room and here's a chair and here's some seeds. Now go eat lunch. And what they're not told is that the Shakers were engaged in all kinds of mystical practices that were the legacy of this hermetic occult revival that swept through Europe. They would go into trances and seances. They would create these magnificent works of art, many of which still survive. There are Shaker hymns that you can listen to online. Go on YouTube. Paintings. And yes, the beautiful furniture and the brooms and the packs of seeds, but they would describe these things as spirit gifts. They felt these things were dictated to them from the other world. The Shakers were extraordinary. They were filled with this passion. Mother Anne's expression was... Um, Hands to work, hearts to God. Hands to work, hearts to God. She believed that the veil between the other world and ours was just so thin. And that in a proper state of prayer, an individual could go into a trance and could receive messages from the world beyond. The Shaker colonies started to spread up to New England, up to Massachusetts, up to Maine, as far south as Kentucky. New religious ideas were on the move in America before there was in America, back in the colonial days. Right around the same time, there was a young woman named Jemima Wilkinson who lived in Rhode Island. Again, from a Quaker family. The Quakers tended to be liberal and they encouraged experimentation. Mother Aunt, um, Jemima Wilkinson got swept up in the last wave of a religious revival that was sweeping New England in 1770, called the Great Awakening. There were many Great Awakenings. People think they were just one, but they keep going and going, like the Who's Farewell Tours, which I've been attending <laughs> since I've been 17 years old, and I will not stop. Um, <laughs> that's true. 1982. Yes. Shay And I just saw them, you know, six months ago <laughs> here in New York. <laughs> we won't stop. Uh, anyway, the Great Awakening was rather like that. It kept going. So, uh, so Jemima Wilkinson got caught up in this wave of the Great Awakening in 1770. Very young at the time. Um, she was uh, 18 years old. By 1776, same time as Mother Ann Lee is laying down the roots of the Shaker movement outside Albany, Jemima takes to her bed in October of 1776 with a very high fever. Her parents think she's going to die because there's a wave of typhus sweeping through New England at that time. And she goes into a coma and she kind of comes in and out of these fever dreams and she's telling her Quaker family that she's seeing angels and receiving visions and they feel, you know, these are just the death rows of a young woman who's just about to leave the physical world. And they're sitting in a death vigil by her bed and then one day after she had been in a coma and, 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 and uncommunicative for several days. This is in the fall of 1776. Jemima rises up from the bed. She's very thin and emaciated because she hasn't eaten for days. And she declares to her shocked family, the woman you knew as Jemima is dead, has gone to the spirit world. 
I am an incarnated spirit occupying her body, and I will only answer to the name Public Universal Friend. <laughs> she declares herself a spirit medium, a channel, and the Public Universal Friend, that Sunday, marches off to church, and after the church service is over, she starts to deliver a homily in the churchyard. And people are shocked because not only is this a young woman they had written off for dead, but this is the first time that any of them have seen a woman deliver a homily in public. This is a theme that repeats and repeats and repeats throughout occult history. It cracks open the door for the first time in modern life for women to visibly and openly serve as religious leaders. Anne Lee and Jemima Wilkinson were publicly recognized, written about, and controversial religious leaders before there was any concept, any concept, that women could participate in any form of civic or political or spiritual culture, period. This would continue as a trend, and I, I write a lot about it in Occult America, it's time alone that limits me from getting more into it tonight. So, Anne Lee, Jemima Wilkinson, and other figures begin to found their colonies in a section of upstate New York between Albany and Buffalo that eventually comes to be called the Burned Over District because it was considered burned over by the fires of religious passion. Again, it was a place of inexpensive land and after the War of Independence, lots of these religious groups that had relocated from Europe or that had been influenced by the groups that had relocated, they were looking for their own colonies, they were looking for a way to start their own movements, and they start founding towns and villages throughout central New York. They're still there. You want to go up to Albany, you can see where Mother Ann Lee laid down her roots. Uh, the Public Universal Friends followers, they were not modest. They started a town in central New York called Jerusalem, and they weren't kidding. And uh, that's where she lived for many years until uh, her death in 1828. And in fact, in the phone directory in Jerusalem, you will still find the names of people who were among the early followers of Jemima Wilkinson. And, and <clears throat> as recently as the 1950s, if you went up to that part of uh, New York State and you sort of talked down her memory, you could get yourself in some trouble. <laughs> Memories have faded to death, but people have still heard of her up there. People have still heard of her. Her name has been forgotten in history, but all these cross currents began to populate this area of central New York State. It was the birthplace in years ahead of Mormonism. It was the birthplace in years ahead of the movement called spiritualism, which involves seances and talking to the dead. I've said so little about that tonight, only because of time limitations, but that was a movement that, to a degree, grew out of what the Shakers were doing. Uh, southwest of the Burned Over District, in the town of Poughkeepsie, New York, where I was honored to speak at the Poughkeepsie Public Library a couple of years ago, there was a young man named Andrew Jackson Davis, who also operating off of traditions that were coming out of Europe, post-Renaissance traditions, particularly a practice called mesmerism, about which so much can be said, but. We won't have time to go into it tonight, but, eventually, but essentially it involved going into a kind of trance state where people came to feel that gifts of second sight manifested, and Americans loved this. As soon as you tell an American, I've got a method for you, whether it's hermetic, whether it's spiritualist, whether it's mesmeric, whether it's a Ouija board, whatever it is, if it'll give you a direct line to the spirit world, Americans love it. We don't like intermediaries. The best of our culture has a do-it-yourself attitude towards everything. So if I can contact the spirit world at my kitchen table, bring it on. You find that attitude repeating throughout American history. So all these movements are sweeping through central New York State and much else besides. Suffragism, first women's, first conference for women's rights is held in Seneca, New York in 1848, right in the heart of the Burned Over District. American utopian experiments, planned communities, utopian idealistic communities based in biblical communism, like the Oneida movement, right in the heart of central New York. Everything was going on in central New York for about one generation, one and a half generations in the first part of the 
19th century. Everything, radical new religious ideas. Anywhere you find cheap land and population movements in America, that's where the new ideas are coming from. Happened in California during an economic boom at the start of the First World War. People say, you know, why is California the birthplace of the New Age? It's not exactly the birthplace of the New Age. It's where the New Age went to grow up. The New Age was born in upstate New York. It moved to California. There are many reasons for that, but one of those reasons is where you see population shifts, where you see migration patterns, where you see economic opportunities, that's where the new religions come from. It's a pattern that repeats itself throughout our American history. The folks who were living in the Burgover District with all these radical occult and mystical ideas that had grown up in the Western world during the Renaissance, that had suffered a setback during the Thirty Years' War, that had trickled across the Atlantic, many of these movements, or their offshoots, came to set down roots in central New York, and as those movements grew, and as their followers and leaders wanted a greater stake in the world, they came down the Hudson River here to New York City. Here to New York City. And for about one generation, from roughly 1845 until 1878, there were so many personalities in New York City, which was developing at the time into a world capital of culture, commerce, religion, whose engineering marvels would eventually start to astonish the world. There were so many of these mystical offshoots that were growing up here, growing up here. And by the year 1875, there was a Russian noblewoman, Madame H.P. Blavatsky, who relocated here. Many of you know her. And she lived in New York City for the better part of the 1870s until she left for India in 1878. She and her collaborator, Henry Steele Olcott, a retired Civil War colonel here in New York City, not far from where we're seated right now, founded the movement called Theosophy, which was dedicated to reintroducing occult ideas, reintroducing the occult search as she saw it into modern life. Starting around that time, for the first time since the Renaissance days, artists and writers and intellectuals began to use this word occult or occultism again and it hasn't stopped since and people began to embrace all these ideas brought by Blavatsky into Western life which held that there were Eastern teachings and cultures of which we knew nothing that the Renaissance scholars just didn't go far enough there were vast teachings coming out of the Buddhist and Vedic traditions. Unknown spiritual masters who had this dispensation for modern industrialized Western people. And at that moment, at that moment, you could hear the earliest sounding of the New Age and of the vast culture of alternative spirituality that would spread not only to California, but to England, to other parts of Europe, and to India, where Blavatsky and Olcott relocated in 1878. And they not only began to instigate a Hindu revival, but they instigated a Buddhist revival as well in other nations of the East, where Buddhist practice was shrinking in the aftermath of missionary campaigns. The influence that shot forth from these religious experimenters was just extraordinary. And the fact that we speak of Halloween today, an ancient Celtic festival, which by all lights, 21st century people shouldn't have even have heard of. Shouldn't have even have heard of. And not only is it a holiday in our time for parties and trick-or-treating, but it is taking on the tones in this generation of a festival of religious retention that's reintroducing ideas from the ancient Celtic world back into modern life. And you see it in the military, and you see it spreading out to other places. That's one twig, one tiny capillary, one tiny branch of this vast influence that grew out of the Renaissance seekers' rediscovery 
of the ancient Egyptian and Hermetic wisdom that was squelched, that came across the Atlantic, and that was able to make use of this vast piece of land as a kind of springboard from which all these alternative religious ideas could be practiced not only in America, but could spread throughout so many other parts of the world. As I said at the beginning of this talk, America, if it has a purpose, I believe, that purpose is the protection of the individual search for meaning. And as long as that has existed in America and in the American colonies and continues to exist, the world has a kind of laboratory, not just one, but it has a great vast engine and laboratory for religious innovation, for individual definitions and redefinitions of meaning. And that really is the story in capsule of occult America and is something for all of us to celebrate together this Halloween. So I thank you all very, very much. It's been great to be here with you. And uh, I'm going to stick around for questions. And